Good to be with you here this evening, and I appreciate the good crowd that we have here. I don't know what the number is, but it's a good number, I can tell you that. I uh, was talking with someone before services began, and I was talking a little bit about the enjoy of preaching. You want to know why I preach? May I share with you why I preach? Last Sunday evening, we had a children's sermon. And uh, I got a little card in the mail after it was over, a few days later. Uh, you can't read this from where you are, but it's, it's in three sections. And you can look, sort of tell by the writing how the age of the people who wrote this. The last section says, Dear Mr. Bob, thank you for letting me wear the goodly Babylonianish mantle. <laughs> Love Vivian. She was the little girl right here. That's why I preach. We have a question, a Bible question and answer series that's been going on Sunday evenings, and it's been a joy to, to me uh, receiving these questions. Excuse me while I get a different remote here. And uh, the questions have been very thoughtful. As I've read these questions, I've been impressed with the sincerity of the questions and with the, the thought that has gone into these questions. And tonight's question is no exception. I'm going to just put the question on the screen for us to think about uh, throughout the, the remarks that we'd like to make now from the Word of God on this subject. Is there anything wrong with me as a Christian pledging allegiance to the flag. The first time I heard about a young person having an, a problem with reciting the Pledge of Allegiance was uh, about maybe 15 years ago. Uh, and the person, the way it came to my attention was this was not a member of the church nor a family that was in the church, uh, but uh, they had a young son who was really struggling with this question and in fact uh, was in a scouting program where he was about to take like the, the, the top step but in order to do that had to recite the Pledge of Allegiance and was having, having trouble with that, really struggling with that. Bob, would you mind talking to our son about this? He, we just can't seem to show him or explain to him why it's okay to say the Pledge of Allegiance. And I remember sitting down and talking with that young man about this. His main concern seemed to be that it was a form of idolatry. Maybe you've heard this or maybe, it, maybe you haven't, but it, it, it impressed me that a young person would think about the issue. Not that they had come to the right conclusion, but they would at least think about it. Is there anything wrong with saying the Pledge of Allegiance? So when I saw this question that we received here, I thought, well, the best way to handle this is to simply look at the points that are raised in the question, because the way this is worded is kind of the, the opposite of the way we normally see a question. Instead of saying, um, is it okay to do this? The question is, is there anything wrong with this? Is there anything wrong with me as a Christian? Now notice it's a specific question. Dealing with Christians saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, there are several things in the question. I'd like, I'd like to read this and then I'll come back and we'll just deal with these points one by one in the order that they were raised and I hope this will be helpful not just to the person who submitted this, but to any of you who might be struggling or know of somebody who might be struggling with this. Is there anything scripturally wrong with me as a Christian pledging allegiance to the flag? Should children in schools be saying the pledge while not understanding it? Is this a form of vain repetition? The pledge was written by Francis Bellamy, a Baptist. While the pledge was written in 1892, the words under God were not included until 1954 by President Eisenhower, a Presbyterian, in response to the communist threat of the times. You can see how this person has done some research and thought about this question. 
The pledge was originally written as a way to sell flags in schools. I don't know if these three points are relevant to your sermon, but I found them interesting. And then the person gives three passages which we will look at and says that there may be other passages, but those are the three that are specifically cited. Let's back up and, and look at this question from a scriptural standpoint. Vain repetitions are addressed in the Word of God very clearly. You know the phrase, you've thought about this. Our Lord specifically forbade the use of vain repetitions in worship to God. But what is a vain repetition? Is the fact that we repeat something, does that, does that fact make it vain? Are all repetitions vain or useless? I happened to be looking at a newspaper that carried a column I had written in, on that very question, and I cut this out because I want to share this with you because I think this is exactly on point on the question of vain repetitions. This question here is, I understand that Jesus commanded not to use vain repetitions. Does this mean we should not repeat things in our prayers? First of all, folks, if it does mean that, I think we're all in a lot of trouble. I don't know of anybody who never repeats anything in prayer, particularly those who lead public prayers. Let me read this answer to you. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gave some very practical instructions concerning prayer, as well as many other matters. One of the things he directed against is the use of vain repetitions, which are positively forbidden. Quote, and in praying, use not vain repetitions as the Gentiles do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7. Note that the command does not forbid repetitions, but vain repetitions. The word vain means empty, useless, done without proper thought. The restriction is against the use of repeated words or phrases in a ritualistic, thoughtless manner. Our prayers should be sincere. We should understand and think about what we're saying each time. There is no place in our prayers for memorized, canned language uttered without thought. Such was characteristic of some of the prayers in Jesus' day. He said they think there is some value in their much speaking. Does this sound familiar in our day? Repetition itself is not bad. In fact, Jesus told the parable of the unrighteous judge in Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, to emphasize the need for Christians to be persistent in prayer and not to faint or grow weary. There's nothing wrong with repeating certain requests in prayer, so long as we are sincerely conscious of what we're saying and doing so in Jesus' name, that is, by his authority. This teaching of Jesus appears in a context which helps explain the meaning. He began this chapter by emphasizing the need to not seek the attention of people in our worship, but rather to seek only to please God. He said, take heed that ye do not your righteousness before men to be seen of them, else ye have no reward with your Father in heaven. Matthew 6.1. He then applied this principle to doing alms, or gifts, praying, and fasting. None of these things should be done in a vain or showy manner. <clears throat> praying is not a time to show off with flowery words or ornate phrases repeated over and over to gain attention. Prayer is an avenue of worshiping God. It's the means by which we speak to God through Jesus as a child would talk to their parent. If we remember that God is like our Heavenly Father and He wants us to approach Him in sincerity and humility, we should have no trouble avoiding vain repetitions. The Pledge of Allegiance is a recitation. It is a memorized statement. 
But the fact that it is repeated cannot make it wrong in and of itself. Did you know that many nations down through history have uh, utilized pledges of allegiance? Pledges, that is, commitments or promises that the subjects of the king would be loyal and support the king. We recently studied the book of Ecclesiastes where Solomon, in essence, says when you take the pledge, don't leave the king hastily. In other words, don't do that lightly and then go out and badmouth the king. Don't even think about badmouthing the king because if you think about it, it's going to eventually come out and word's going to get back to him. Remember that? So it was commonplace for kings to require their subjects to affirm their allegiance in some kind of pledge or oath. Uh, the United States is not unusual in that. Now let me say before going forward with some scriptural principles here, you're looking at somebody who takes very seriously our freedoms and the privileges that we enjoy in this country. And I feel that I'm speaking by and large to people of like mind. I know we appreciate this nation in which we live. <clears throat> I know there's a lot of things that are wrong and there are things that, that are portending problems down the line. There are some real concerns in our land right now, but the United States of America is still, in my view, the greatest land on the face of this earth. And we are so privileged to be able to live here. I mean, having done some study, as I know you have, of the legal background, some of our founding fathers and their documents, it is amazing the forethought that went into these documents and the founding of our country, the blessings that we enjoy. If, if Christians of the first century could accept commandments to honor the king, to pray for those in high places, to uh, be in subjection to the higher powers, Romans 13, 1 and following, if those commands could be practiced in the first century, surely in a land such as this, we should have no trouble obeying those commandments today. I mean, th this is easy compared to what some of our forefathers had to go through. Uh, our fathers chained in dungeons dark were still in heart and conscience free. You ever read the words to some of the songs that we sing and think about what's being said there? Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. We, we don't have that kind of persecution upon us. Now, the day may come where we do, but we should be so thankful to be able to stand with respect and put our hand on our heart and pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Now, if the United States of America commands you or me to do something in violation of God's word, we, ha we have scriptural precedent for what we should do. Peter said in Acts chapter 5, we must obey God rather than man. But how many times do we take for granted the many precious freedoms that we enjoy in this country? And we have them, whereas people, many parts of the world could only dream of such. So that's a, that's a basic point to, to, that runs throughout this. The fact that the pledge was written by a person who is of an erroneous faith, that is a faith which includes error in its practice and profession, does not change the truthfulness of the words in the pledge. There are many things that uh, were written and said good things by people who did not have all of their uh, doctrinal beliefs correct. Did you know that many of the songs in our songbook, and, and I say songbook, you notice there's no songbooks in the racks right now, but the songs that we sing in our worship, many of them were written by people who were not members of the Lord's church. But the sentiments expressed there in that particular song are correct anyway. 
can we not recite those sentiments with profit today? Can't we read a poem or recite a poem or a song that was written by somebody who, who wasn't entirely correct on other things and still benefit from that? Well, of course we can. Uh, Paul, in his missionary journeys, would often utilize the literature of the day to teach points, as certain even of your own poets would say, he said, for we are also his offspring. He quoted their own heathen poets to advance a point that he was making in his preaching. If we quote Ralph Waldo Emerson, that doesn't mean that we endorse everything that Emerson ever believed or taught. It says, while the pledge was written in 1892, the words under God were not included at that time. And that's correct. And, and it is true that they were added later. A good addition, I would say, because it, it expresses a sentiment that's very near and dear to the hearts of most Americans. It's a nation under God. But whether the pledge says that or not, it's true. It is a nation that is under God. God is the ultimate sovereign of any nation. He is the king. And every soul is to be in subjection to him. Now, as to the statement that the pledge was originally written as a way to sell flags in schools, I don't know that. I'm not doubting that there, that may have had some bearing on it from a commercial standpoint, but it really isn't relevant to the question. Why the pledge was originally written doesn't matter as to the question, is it scriptural to say the Pledge of Allegiance today? You do know that many practices began out of, uh, let, let's say, less than honorable motives, but they have been continued and adapted and used in a favorable way. So don't, get, don't allow yourself to get caught up in a side issue that really is not relevant to the, fun, to the fundamental question here. Let's look at these three scriptures together. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14 will be the first one. Turn, please, in your Bible to that. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. The Apostle Paul is addressing the matter of thanksgiving and worship. He said in verse uh, 12, in whom we have boldness and access in confidence through our faith in him. Wherefore, I ask that ye may not faint at my tribulations for you, which are your glory. In other words, Paul was encouraging them to not get discouraged at his problems. He was, he was in prison when he wrote this letter. This is one of the four prison epistles. And he's telling them, don't you be discouraged because of my tribulations. You just hang in there and keep it up. And he says, for this cause, verse 14, I bow my knees unto the Father. Okay. He's saying that I worship God and I'm thankful to God and I express my thanks to God. I bow my knees unto the Father. Bowing is a, bowing is a symbol of thanksgiving or acknowledgement or respect. When an, an actor does a performance and then takes a bow, he or she is saying, thank you. I'm honored to present to you. When we bow before the Father, we are showing respect to the Father. But that's not the only posture of prayer that is referred to in the Bible. Remember that Stephen stood as he prayed, looking up into heaven. Our Lord was lying prostrate on the ground in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. The posture is not specified. If it were, that would be the only posture we could assume in prayer. But now notice, this is referring to prayer. This isn't referring to a governmental oath or pledge or a pledge of allegiance. If we do say the pledge of allegiance, we need to do it respectfully for the same reason that we would do everything respectfully. And anything that a Christian utters 
which takes us to this second passage, which is uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. This one is, I think, the one that bears most directly on this question. And so we're going to take just a little bit of time and look at the context here. Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. In Jesus' day, the, the scribes and the Pharisees and their ancestors, religious ancestors, had so traditionalized and honed the law of Moses into such a list of traditions that they had largely forgotten many of the basic, substantial parts of the law. They had let their traditions outweigh the, the spirit of the law itself. And that's what Jesus is correcting here. You have heard that it was said, X, but I say unto you, and then he takes them back even deeper into the heart of God. You've heard that it was said, thou shalt not kill, but I say not to be angry with your brother. You've heard that it was said, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say not to look on a woman to lust after her. You've heard in verse 33 again, that it was said to them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself. Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. All right? In Jesus' day, and this is important to understand the context here, various types of oath had developed by tradition. Even today, in certain Eastern cultures, if a person swears by their head, it means one thing. If they swear by the beard on their face, it means something else. In Jesus' day, if a person swore by God, they had to keep that oath. If they would swear, let's say, by the temple, well, it might depend. Uh, there's certain furniture in the temple or certain things about the temple that were more holy than others in their mind. So I could swear by the temple, I could swear by uh, the heaven, I could swear by the earth. And it reminds me of a child sort of uh, promising their mother that uh, he or she will do something or not do something. They've got their fingers crossed behind their back. Did you ever do that? You, you never did that. But that means you don't have to do it, right? That's the way they thought. Well, what kind of thinking is that? If you swear, they were di differentiating based on the type of oath that was taken. But notice what Jesus says. He says, you've heard it said, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is the throne of God, nor by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet. Notice how everything is tied back to God. So it really doesn't matter there's no difference which of these things would, would qualify the oath. Nor by the city of uh, by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, with a capital K. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, for thou canst not make one hair white or black. Okay, who can? God. Again, it all traces back to God. But let your speech be yea, yea, or nay, nay. And whatsoever is more than these is of the evil one. Is he saying that you can never take an oath? No, he's saying when you take an oath, mean it. Whether it's by the heaven, the earth, the throne, the city, whatever it is. Our Lord, in essence, took an oath in Matthew chapter 26 when he was being arraigned and I'm going to use that word very, very loosely because it was the most unfair of arraignments. But he is put through the mockery of a trial. And that included positions of uh, asking him, uh, quote, under oath, uh, are you the king? Are you uh, the Messiah? Uh, let's see, Matthew chapter 27, he's before Pilate. And let's see. 
Is it, thank you, Dawn. I should have had that one. Chapter 26, verse 24. Thank you very much. Except that that's not it. <laughs> Is it Matthew 26, 24, did you say? Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I was looking for a verse where he is questioned, are you the king? 2711. Okay. Now, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Now, if you will compare the language of that verse to the other interrogations that are made of Jesus, you'll find that that was a legal uh, technique. He was being questioned by the magistrate or by the governor or the chief priest or whomever it may be. He would, I adjure thee, I ask you under oath, are you a king? And when Jesus says, thou sayest, he's, he is saying, yes, I am. He, in essence, is saying what we would say, uh, uh, you said it. He is answering the question and saying yes. Okay. And that is typical of Jesus' response. He doesn't uh, always answer, but when he does, he, he is answering under oath. When the Apostle Paul is questioned and examined, uh, same thing. We see that language. But what he's saying is truthful. It is correct. All right. Um, when you were married, and the preacher said, is there a token of this pledge? And your best man pulled that ring out of his pocket and handed it to the preacher. And the preacher took the ring and looked at it and made some comments about it. That ring there, what, what was that? Was that not a token, a sign of something deeper? And when, you, when he asked you that question before God and these witnesses, what were you doing? Were you not making a pledge of allegiance? Were, were you not making a promise, a commitment before God and these witnesses? And was that ring not a token of that pledge? When we say the pledge of allegiance, we're not just making a pledge to a, a piece of cloth, not just to the flag. It is for the, to the republic for which it stands. You see that? We are honoring that republic to the extent that anyone can, again, provided it does not violate God's law. So these are matters that are very important. I think the passage in James chapter 5 and verse 12 is the same thing. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, your nay nay, lest you fall into condemnation. Christian, when you say yes, you don't have to say, I swear by heaven. I swear by the earth. Just say yes. And guess what you can do? When a Christian says yes, you can believe it. When a Christian says, I will do this or that, you can mark it down. Unless they are somehow hindered beyond their own ability, they're going to do it. It's a matter of respect, it's a matter of honesty, it's a matter of, of keeping our word. I hope that these principles are helpful to us as we think about the culture in which we live today. I, I remember, you know, the big dust up a few years ago about football players who would kneel instead of pledge allegiance to the fly or sing the national anthem or whatever it was. Brethren, you can put me down as thoroughly opposed to any sign of disrespect to our great land. I mean, I just don't get that. And I'm sorry if that offends anybody here. I don't mean to offend. We can show respect to God and we can show respect to our country. Jesus said, render unto God the things that are God's and unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Two distinct areas of responsibility there. No conflict there. But when I am disrespectful to my country or to my nation uh, and to my flag, I am disrespecting all of the men who have fought and died and shed their life's blood 
so that I have the privilege of seeing that flag. And that should never be taken lightly. I don't care who we are or how much money we're making. Our Lord has given us these blessings, and we should use them to his name's honor and glory. So if you're, if you're struggling with saying Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, let me just assure you that's not, the, that's not a vain repetition. That's not idol worship because you're not worshiping the, the, the object itself. That's not a form of uh, image or image olatry. Uh, that's not a form of elevating the nation over God. I can't think of anything wrong with, with me as a Christian pledging allegiance to the flag. I'm not aware of any reason why that, that could not be done. Let me say this in closing. We're going to extend the invitation at this point. There are some who have questioned some of these things lately, especially because of the pandemic and the issues that we've been facing. I was speaking recently to a Christian who was some, very offended because the mask issue was not taking, taken seriously enough for that person. And I tried to assure this person, listen, although the governor's mask mandate is over in this state, so wearing masks is optional, still, if a person wishes and feels the need to wear a mask in these worship services, they are certainly encouraged to do that. Out of respect, what, what else could we do? Isn't that the, the position of showing respect one to another? I don't know if that person is watching now online or not, but if so, I hope you will remember that no man or woman can keep you from worshiping God scripturally. Nobody can keep you away from his people except the devil himself. You say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag and you stand up for your nation and your country, and you stand up for everything else that you can as long as it's not in conflict with God's word. And don't let people tear you up with these kind of controversies that just result in a lot of disputes and don't advance the cause of Christ one little bit. If you're subject to our Lord's invitation this evening, you see the scriptures on the screen. Uh, if we can help you in your obedience to the gospel, we would be delighted to do so. Would you come while we stand in